Okay, we are recording. I am Brandon Polite, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois. And I'm joined by Laura DeSuma, who's Associate Professor of Philosophy at William Patterson University in Wayne, New Jersey. Uh, Laura, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Awesome. So we're talking about your book, which I have right here, A Philosophy of Fashion Through Film on the Body, Style, and Identity, which came out, let me hold it up better, uh, which came out uh, from Bloomsbury in 2022. Um, I highly recommend this book to people. It's absolutely fantastic. It's clearly written. Uh, it's engaging. It's philosophically rich. The examples are fantastic. So Thank you for writing an awesome book, and thank you again for joining me. Um, and to, to begin, I just want to, you know, touch on basically the first chapter of the book, which is on the nature of fashion. And so the first question then is, what is fashion? Because it seems like, you know, the clothes I wear on a typical day-to-day -day basis aren't especially fashionable. Uh, it, it seems like, you know, they're just mere clothes, right? Whereas fashion seemingly needs to be this elevated thing. And so just can you start us off by telling us what, at least in your view, fashion is? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, it's kind of like about the everyday clothes. I don't know. To some extent, like I want to weave them into with my definition. So first, what the definition is not like I'm not a fashion historian. Um I love fashion history. I read a lot of fashion history. I follow fashion, but this is not a definition of fashion from that kind of lens. Um, what I'm looking at is a philosophical definition of fashion, and in part because philosophers just don't really care, or like they don't really care, are starting to care about fashion. So um had to phrase it from that specific standpoint. I'm I think like the the kind of like core notion of my philosophy of fashion is that uh, it's not about objects. It's not just about like the kind of stuff that you pick up at a store that has a price tag on or whatever is hanging in your closet. It's um, one thing that I always say when I talk about it is that fashion is a two fashion. It is, it is a performance. It's this kind of like very complex work in progress. And so once I found myself with like, you know, this this really kind of like deep seated believing to me that that it is a performance. I'm like, well, but what exactly does it do? And uh, so that's why I kind of like, I don't want to exclude the everyday clothes because I don't know, maybe they do something to you. Maybe they do something to your everyday life, but to the kind of like, you know, complex web of social relationships in which we live. And, um, and then exploring what fashion does uh, kind of, brought me um into another direction which is another like area of, of philosophy and on aesthetics so that has always been important to me which is identity in in how we talk about identity and everyone in the fashion world and it's kind of like common sense to say that like oh fashion is an expression of my identity fashion is connected to identity again but the question for me again is yeah but how like I'm not okay with saying that, um, I don't know, I'm wearing a shirt with rockets on it because my two years older like rock likes rockets, right? Like, yeah, I mean, that's definitely a portion of it, but it needs to be something else. And so the book is this kind of like exploration step by step using a bunch of movies um, of how fashion can actually do something how and I mean I know that objects don't necessarily do things but you know grant me the poetic license and uh it's a how fashion does specific things and, and in terms of what it does uh, also what it does to our to our identity to the kind of persons that we are yeah That's right and so the broad framework yeah so so you're thinking of fashion you know not in terms of objects but in terms of actions or performances, right? That fashion is to fashion and therefore it's a verb rather than a noun. And yeah, um, I mean, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think like, even if you think about it, like in like really kind of like layman terms, right? Like if you have something that is hanging in a closet, to me, that's not really fashion. It is fashion in the moment in which it is attached to your body, in which you're using it to go somewhere. Uh, it performs over time um you know with with kids clothes everyone knows this like you know they last about two hours and a half and then you know a second later the kids are like ginormous and the kids you know the clothes don't fit anymore 
it goes through time and there's a performance, there's a generational performance, there are ceremonies, um, there's the kind of stuff that you wear at work. There are all these different things that do participate into the performance of fashion. So even if you don't immediately get to identity, you do realize that without that kind of performative nature, probably we wouldn't be talking about fashion to begin with. Yeah, right. That, that you know, you have your work clothes and that's a way of performing professionalism with respect to whatever profession you have. And that could be a uniform, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's a firefighter's uniform, policeman's uniform, target employees, you know, rough uniform, you know, you've got, yeah. you need a red shirt, basically. Uh, as anyone who's been to Target wearing a red shirt knows, people think you work there because you seem to have the uniform, right? And so it does seem to be, you know, at least signaling something socially with respect to uh, your clothing. And before we started recording, I mentioned to you, you know, this during the pandemic, you know, especially during lockdown, um, when so many of us were doing work, you know, you and I were holding classes over Zoom, right? Our students were at home, you know, running their lives through, uh, zoom right that so many of us you know just wore pajamas all day or just wore our comfy sweatsuits yeah. all day with mustard stains etc et right and there is this uh piece on npr that i heard from a psychologist that was basically like this is actually harmful to us because you know we're uh we break up our days in terms of, you know, we get up, we change out of our pajamas into our work clothes, we go to work, then maybe we change into our gym clothes, go to the gym, and then maybe we turn, you know, change into our evening wear if we're going out, uh, and then we come home, change into pajamas, right? And so our days are demarcated, you know, socially and psychologically by our changes of clothes, which, you know, are, are ways of performing particular roles at particular points in our life. And when the pandemic obliterated our ability to, you know, go to the office and then, you know, go to lunch and then go to the gym to go places, right? Uh, you know, part of, you know, the rut we all felt ourselves in was precisely because we were wearing the same clothes throughout the day. And, you know, this person suggested when you get on Zoom for work, put on your work clothes ahead of time, right? When you're going to work out at home, put on your gym clothes, Right. Just as a way to like work yourself out of that funk to, you know, slice up your day in the various roles that you're you're playing. And that very much, uh, I think, is not merely consistent, but is evidence in support of the, this view that you have of fashion as fundamentally a performative thing that relates to, you know, our bodily engagement with with the social world, basically. Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned like bodily engagement to like things such as. I'm I'm going to work. I'm going to the gym. But you know, as you know, as as we all know, a lot of social engagement it takes like a number of different forms, and uh, sometimes, and very often, actually, almost inevitably, that kind of social engagement also has to do with your identity as a body in the world. Um, it has to do with your gender. It has to do with your sexual orientations. It has to do with your race. It has to do with your perception of abilities. And these are topics that I touch upon in the book and uh, and clothes are our way of, of thinking about this um clothes are a way of experimenting with this there is a, of course there's like a ton of literature and I do want to acknowledge that to the seas clothes are confining you in a special social category actually this is true from you know Simmel like Simmel has like one of the first like one of the earliest analysis of fashion in uh his analysis is kind of like there's twofold. Like on the one hand, he understood that fashion can actually differentiate you, but he immediately understood and he talked so much about the fact that it's like, you know, commodification is a thing. You can actually segment yourself within that specific category, uh, within that specific like social class or like category in the same way in which you can segment your day um, according to clothes. So those are things to keep in mind. And, uh, you know, it's like one thing that, that is kind of like um, relatively common, but you know that like fashion can uh, um, can can improve something to some extent. I think if you think about like sports clothes, for example, like, you know, they can enhance your performance and so on, or maybe like a beautiful dress, like if you're wearing a gown and like, you know, you feel better about yourself and so on. Not me, but um, that's the thing. Uh, <laughs> 
uh, at the same time, they can also really, really restrict you. And uh, and so there is there is this you know idea of it's like well it's connected to identity but it's also a way of like hindering identity. So like I just wanted to say that kind of like in like so there is stays like in the back of our minds. That's not something that I'm denying. Fashion does that too, but I don't think we have investigated as much what fashion can do from let me just say it like a more positive standpoint, a more like in terms of like fashion explorations and. And I think it is important to, to keep like both dimensions in mind when you're thinking about the kind of identity fashion can help you shape or help you think about when we are also considering body identity, research in aesthetics on body aesthetics, but overall the million and a half intersectional debates uh, um, that have already confronted these questions of like identity, body, race, and gender ability, and so on. And so how do you place fashion in all of this? Uh, well, again, dichotomy, but there is also like a positive side. And I think like in my book, I try to explore mostly that positive side and see maybe because I, I want people to think about fashion as something that can do something. Um, maybe even like, maybe like an even more mindful appreciation of, of who we are. Yeah, right. And one thing that I just thought of as you were talking is, you know, children often engage in pretend play, right? Where they dress up like a superhero or dress up like a firefighter or whatever, and they pretend to do those things. And, and it, the costume is doing a large part of that work for them. Um, and in a sense, your view is that sort of extends throughout our everyday lives, right? That our flows are sort of like costumes that, you know, when I go to teach, I put on my professor costume. And when, you know, I go to a fancy banquet, I don't know the last time I went to a fancy banquet, but just, you know, bear with me. Exactly. You know, when I go to a fancy <laughs> banquet, I put on my fancy banquet costume, Right. And that those are ways, again, of performing certain roles. And so, you know, the connection you're making between fashion, you know, and costume, mm -hmm. which is an important distinction that you make um, in, in the book, but thereby, you know, relating it to film, I think is absolutely an apt analogy to be making. And, and so your your exploration of fashion through film in the book makes total sense. Yeah. So, I mean, I think two things about that, like the example of like children wearing costumes that uh, I think it's like super interesting one. Um, I do think that like, I mean, children tend to do this, like, I don't know, like, I mean, the ones I met in my life, they all love to do this kind of like, I'm going to be a superhero. And then, you know, they start like spinning around the apartment and, um, uh, but I think he also has a lot to do with like something that I say in terms of like fashion and identity that is like, I don't think we all use fashion to express who we are. And I think that like fashion actually discovers who we are or helps us become who we are rarely for some people, for some people that is the case. I count myself among those people, but I perfectly understand if someone tells me, I don't think fashion has ever taught, taught me anything. I just find it like a burden. Like it's just something that I, I'm trying to keep up with that uh, I, you know, lost hope and uh, that's it. Like whatever I found is in my closet. But I think for kids that, that kind of like that dressing up, it's really a way of like exploring. Like it's not just I want, I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating, but I do have this kind of like, you know, I'm kind of like, kind of always curious, like, are you just, do you just want to be a superhero or are you actually really trying to figure out who the heck you are? And, and I think like the dressing up, the pretend games and like all these things that like children do like routinely because they're not afraid of doing this stuff all the time are kind of indicative of what fashion can do. Because to me, fashion can contribute to your identity, not only if I'm, you know, wearing a specific thing because uh, it represents the kind of person that I am, but because I'm wearing something and then I'm looking at myself and I'm like, oh shit, I can be that too. And, you know, and it's like this kind of like exploration of, of the person that you are. And in order to explore, you need tools, right? And I think like fashion can work a little bit as that kind of tool. Um, so that, that's just a little bit on the, you know, on the kids portion. And, uh, and I think I can return on that a little bit more. It's like, what do exactly I mean by identity here? Um, and in terms of film, yeah, I mean, I... I wanted to use film from the start. Uh, there are a number of reasons why I wanted to use film. Uh, the most basic one, I'm also a film scholar. <laughs> and, uh, 
Um, but I I wanted to use film because I do think film has a lot of advantages. Like we very often end up like talking about the personality of a fictional character a lot more and we're like a lot more engaged than we're talking about the personality of a partner or of a friend. Like I don't care about talking about like, you know, the, the character and behavior of a partner of a friend. If they want, they can find a therapist. And but fictional characters, man, I'm like, you know, I just can't I can't stop talking about like one of those. And with fashion, it's a little bit like the same thing. I might not pay too much attention to clothes in everyday life, but once I see them on a character, then those clothes actually become like incredibly significant. And, and also in movies, you do see clothes perform like all the time. Actually, the performance is more important than the object because you're not going to wear what that person is wearing anyways. Uh, so you have this kind of like, you know, in a very kind of like Aristotelian fashion, it's kind of vantage point of like, you are like behind the screen and you're observing these people becoming who they are very often because they're wearing, which is actually a topos in film in a million, including superheroes, right? You put the costume on and you become someone who's different. So the connection to identity is kind of like spoon fed to you from the start. Uh, you observe those clothes moving and performing in a number of different ways. And also, I think those costumes are indicative of what that movie is trying to tell you. And I think this is more like the last point is my like philosophy of motion picture, motion pictures like addition to the book. Um, philosophers talk a lot, obviously, about like whether movies can uh, do philosophy, like in a proper way, like in a serious way. And there are like a lot of essays on, you know, the whole question of thought experiments and so on. And I don't want to talk about those. I don't really talk about those a lot in the book either. Um, but one thing that has always like made me a little mad is that when people talk about the philosophical value of film, they talk about stories all the time and the kind of stories that movies tell them. Like, okay, yeah, it's true. Like some movies have like incredible narratives. Uh, if you look at film noir, probably like, the best narratives you can think of so let's first talk about moods which I like better you know like Robert Sinnerberg's work for example but I felt since I never talked about costumes and like how those can actually help um you know like really let like the philosophical core of of the film emerge and um so there is definitely a portion a portion of that and then I do have to say and I do have to anticipate this Fashion is not costumes. They're like two different things. It's just that costumes in this specific case seem to help me a lot more, or at least make a, like a more concrete, a more direct example uh, when it comes to explaining exactly what I mean by fashion. Okay, yeah. So let's let's take those backwards. Maybe the yeah. so how do we differentiate fashion from costumes, and then from there we can get to how costumes help films do philosophy right as opposed to being you know things that philosophers can analyze right that you know there's sort of case studies right mm -hmm. as opposed to no they're actively contributing yeah. to philosophical inquiry or something of that sort for so the first question then is how, how do you differentiate between fashion and costume yeah i mean uh this is there, definitely like there is a lot of like crossing roads in terms of like fashion history and the history of costume design. Um, but I am one of those people that really believe that the two should be kept to some extent separate. It's absolutely true that you have a lot of fashion designers that are also kind of like doubling as costume designers. In a few cases of like the other way around, but the two are separate and uh, one I guess one interesting way of distinguishing them is that if you are a fashion designer, you are selling glamour. You are selling something that is absolutely wonderful. You're selling this this dream that people in the end though, want to buy, right? Like there is, like you start with something that is completely like up in the air and super cool and glamorous and so on, but in the end, it's gonna have a price tag and it's gonna be in a shop. Um, even though a lot of the stuff that is like on runway shows never actually does that, but that's a different conversation. Uh, if you're a costume designer, no, you like, if I, if I'm watching a movie and I stop and I'm be like, oh man, what's that person wearing? It just doesn't make any sense. That's just failure, right? 
like it doesn't matter if like you're looking at like Willy Wonka or like a you know more realistic character you're just gonna have to buy into it like that character can only possibly wear those clothes and maybe you see three outfits but to me in the head of a costume designer there are probably like 50 there is like there's the entire wardrobe there is like stuff that has been passed on by a relative um stuff that they're not wearing so you have something that is actually real even though those clothes are actually not with us they used to be that's part of also the intersection like between the two industries like in the 1930s for example like a lot of the stuff that was in movies then immediately get got into department stores and so on which kind of like same fashion historically at least in the united states but that's a different conversation and uh, i tend to go on a tangent so that's a big difference um but again as i was as i was saying um Fashion in film, so costumes in film, do exactly what I take fashion to be capable of doing from a philosophical standpoint. So they are a way of discovering the identity of a character in terms of body identity and personal identity. They're capable of like tracing that specific narrative. They are fundamentally performative in part because the movie is a performance. Uh, and also very often, not in every movie, but in some movies, and this is why I like I made, you know, a selection of movies like in my book. In some movies, those clothes, those accessories really do something for the character. Like without that specific item of clothing, the character would have not done what it ends up doing, would have not have been received the way it is actually received. So they actually have this kind of like they discover the character they're not just the character they do something more and that's something more sometimes really adds to our perception our love our attachment to the characters maybe maybe because clothes are capable of doing this kind of like incredible things in terms of our personalities and that character actually becomes memorable yeah yeah, yeah right and so um you know one connection back to you know, fashion and personal identity relates to what what you said, right? That, you know, we, as you said, we discover the character in part through the clothing that they're wearing, through mm -hmm. their wardrobe, through the costuming. Um, and, you know, this is something you mentioned in the book that actors very much describe that, right? That they only discovered the character once they were fitted for wardrobe or, you know, once they, you know, with the director work through the various outfits they could be wearing, like they put on a particular outfit or a particular hat or even a particular wig, right? And once they saw themselves in the mirror, they were like, no, this is them. Or once they felt how it moved yeah. on their body, they are like, okay, this is how this person moves. This is how this person behaves. This is how they yeah. feel, right? And, and it's interesting that that can then be reflected in our experience as the audience with the character that we could discover them through the clothing choices that that character has made. Yeah, I mean, we follow them that way. And sometimes we also go past the character, right? Like we build our philosophical understanding of the movie, our kind of like afterlife, thanks to those specific choices. And uh, I don't know, like, um, I don't know if you've seen May December, the Todd Haynes stuff. And like, I, I love Todd Haynes. Like, I don't love all these movies, but in general, I just love him. And uh, so I'm I'm not going to spoil anything. But like, I like watch it like at two o'clock in the morning two nights ago. So like my references are probably like not as sharp as they should be. But there is like one sequence in the beginning where uh, Julianne Moore, I mean, everyone knows the story, I think, at this point. So like... Um, um, what's her name? Um, uh, Natalie Portman is uh, is is gonna make a movie. She's gonna study a character. The character is Julianne Moore about her life. So she kind of like essentially like moves in, and uh, and Julianne Moore, the main character, is okay with this. So despite the story she's gonna tell, it's kind of like it's a harsh story. It's a harsh movie to watch. Um, but you know, there's Julianne Moore, and you know, Ali Portman is still not there, and she says something about like, I just hope she's not gonna like show up with our big, you know, Hollywood diva sunglasses on, and you know, just sit there and watch us all, or like something like that. And and then at the very end of the movie, there is an encounter between the two of them, and of course, like 
they're wearing very similar clothes and like clothes are so important in all Tom Haynes films. And, and, you know, Julianne Moore, the one that was worried about the huge sunglasses was this huge ginormous pair of like Hollywood diva sunglasses. And she just faces her and tells her, you know what, I'm secure. And like, I'm like, really, like I could, I could have, I don't want to like maybe too much, but like I could have anticipated that sentence, just the moment in which like I see her like trotting towards Natalie Portman with this kind of like ginormous pair of sunglasses. And, you know, it's it's definitely there. It's a part of the film, but it's like, it's so significant that it's in the beginning and it's at the end. And, and the overall like question of security, safety, and what it means, it's like so central to the film. Yeah, right. That that, you know, as as you said, philosophers so often treat films mainly in terms of their story, which you could get pretty much from reading the script, right? It, it's, you know, similar to engaging with plays just by reading the text, right? That no, 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 these are meant to be performed. And so much of the meaning comes out from the performance. And then once you have film, right? I mean, I guess it's performance and like the stage directions, et cetera. Right. But with film, then you also get costume, which I guess you also get with theater. But then there's choices of editing, choices of uh, you, lighting, oh yeah, et cetera. Yeah. And I think there's actually really, I think, the cool about film um, in terms of thinking about clothes is that you see characters wearing and taking off their clothes, which is like, if you want, like the kind of like base performance of of of. of of clothing right like we don't go outside naked it's it's taboo and like so the first performance of clothing is really to be on your body and the you know we, we're always with them and you know maybe we'll touch upon this later uh, but in the case of like film you actually do see this kind of like a component of of like changing putting something on getting you know home, getting back home after like a long day at work and like what is the first thing that you do like you change like it's literally the first thing and uh so i think that's just like on a side note like one really interesting aspect of film that that you know that you actually do see their daily life and also their value in terms of what's happening to the character yeah yeah, yeah, right. And, and you know, th this hooks up to the, the point about fashion and personal identity that, you know, with film, like through watching a character, we can discover something about ourselves, right? That, that oh, like what's going on with them is similar to what I'm going through. And, and so film in that sense and characters can help us think through our lives, but also they're, they can, you know, sort of be uh, role models for, I want to be like this character, right? And and so it could lead to that process of exploration you were talking about and sort of self-discovery and self-transformation where, oh, I want to be more like them, not give a fuck like they, you know, do, you know, not be so anxious to be, uh, you know, more open and outgoing, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And and fashion can do the same thing, you know, as you were talking about before, you know, trying on clothes, um, is a way of being like, oh, I could be that way. Oh, I could feel that way. Yeah, I mean, the, like sometimes sometimes the character can can act as an example. Sometimes it doesn't, it's the exact opposite. But like, that really works. Like, you know, going back to identity, like I think like one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about what fashion can do is that you have all these accounts of, of personal identity, you know, from Locke on... And there is a lot of focusing on narrative identity and it's like, you know, and you, you it's like different versions, right? There is like the strong version, the weaker version, the one that like combines elements in between, like as always in philosophy, but everything in the end is kind of like based on this kind of like recounting the facts of your life and you just put them together, whether it works or not and so on. And like, I'm, I'm really curious about it. You know, I wrote my dissertation on memoir and, uh, uh, and I love literature, but then like, well, first of all, like I kind of like agree with Galen Strassen. I'm not a narrative being, I'm a man. Like I just put things like together sometimes, <laughs> but most of the time I don't. But then I'm like, okay, so if I have to talk about my identity and my personal identity, yeah, of course, like I can talk about, I don't know, the philosophy professor that I had in high school that kind of like instilled my love in philosophy. And then because of that, I ended up doing a PhD in philosophy. 
I don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe that works. But you know, what's more interesting to me is like, it's all the time I mess up. And like all the different like experiments, the tentativeness, the, the stupid things I've done and all the things that completely diverge from this path to some extent. And like, those are actually considered like without those, maybe this would not be the actual path. And, and I can keep like, putting on all the nice stories like you know the ones that I first person reporting whether that's reliable or not it's not uh stuff that I you know hear from my parents and friends and stuff like that but also I'm like maybe like what about all the experiments what about like all this moments and fashion does that and in part because the consequences of kind of like playing around with it are not as bad as playing around with you know being a parent uh i'm you know i it's that you know great privilege and a great responsibility yeah, i'm trying not to mess it up you know with clothes i can mess it up i've done it like i've done it so many million times i like tell my students you know i used to have blue hair and a lot more piercings than i have now uh was a portion of my life did i stick to it no i did not um but it's so important that i did and and if we don't talk about like those moments like the the you know really the falling down and the like standing back up and all the times we were confused all the time that we tried something then I yeah I'm okay with like beautiful accounts of identity that end up with this kind of nice story that we can tell about ourselves that is full of value and meaning but I like to talk about the other stuff too and and I think for me fashion was like a way of like opening that door and and, and look at that and uh you know, costumes and masks and, and like micro mistakes uh, uh, are also essential to like, as, as also essential, they kind of like, they can also support what in the end ends up being the main narrative of who you actually end up being. But without those experiments, you probably would not be the person you are. Yeah, right. And so, you know, it seems like the standard line among philosophers is the narrative theory of identity, right? That that, you know, our identities are these stories that we tell to ourselves, but as stories, they need to be consistent and coherent. But, you know, as you were mentioning, our lives are incredibly messy, right? <laughs> that, yeah. uh, and, you know, when someone or we ourselves or someone else we know, you know, behaves in a way that they standardly don't, we say they're acting out of character, right? right. And so it seems like we, at least implicitly, operate with this notion of, our it's lives easy. are our lives are a story. It we are characters it in it, but we act out of character all the time. And who's yeah. to say that's not me because it doesn't fit the narrative that I've constructed for myself or that others have constructed for me? Yeah. No. I mean, to me, it's like the narrative conception of identity. I mean, there is a lot that is like really great about it. That some don't get me wrong, but I think like one of the reasons why it's prevalent is because it's the easiest way of getting by um you know like you go to a party and people serve you like the elevator talk in terms of their lives like i went to school here and like i live here and this is my job and you know the kids go to school there and blah blah, blah. and in five minutes you have like the prepackaged narrative and i'm like yeah it's it's fine it works it perfectly works i got a sense of like who you are but if you i think are engaging with identity you know like maybe in a slightly more skeptical way too, like then I also want to see all those moments in which we have experimented, we've made mistakes, uh, we felt completely out of character. And because uh, they're kind of essential, it's like part of the battle. It's a little bit like running an experiment in a lab, right? Like I can tell you like the time I got all the right components in. <clears throat> and uh, there you go, successful experiment, but like, behind a successful experiment and there are always a million failed ones. So, and yeah. I think that's the same with identity. And, and I think fashion is an interesting way to look at it because at least people, and I'm again, I'm gonna say not everyone like treats fashion in this way. People that are like particularly keen on <clears throat> using fashion to kind of like express their identity do like to experiment a lot and, and use fashion to do that. <laughs> yeah, right. And you know what you're describing, it, it you know, it reminds me of I think it's chapter two of On Liberty, where John Stuart Mill talks about, I think, precisely experiments in living or experiments yeah. of experiments living. I forget. Living. Yeah, yeah I think right. That, that, 
we we discover or become who we are just by screwing around <clears throat> Basically, I had it in a slide the very first time I talked about fashion at the conference. <laughs> I just love that sentence. I know it's fantastic. And, you know, yeah. we, we become who we are just by screwing around, messing around mm -hmm. like and, and, you know, I think that's, you know, children aren't afraid generally of messing up. Right. Like, yeah. oh, I'll be and this way today. They're usually less verbal. So like yeah. the idea of like putting together like a whole story, like. They try, I mean, they try, you know, it's like when you have like a non, like a constant non sequitur, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> they, but then, but then in terms of like their pretend games in how they dress up, the kind of stuff that they come up with and so on, it's, it's an experiment. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think in non sequiturs, so I, <laughs> <laughs> like keeping this interview on something like a, a track is uh, difficult in general <laughs> for me. Um, Maybe for me too. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we have generally. Um, uh, uh, yeah. And so, you know, again, the, the notion of, you know, that sort of fashion can help us break free, at least to some extent, from the standard line of identity as narrative, right? The story that we tell about ourselves, I think is is really <laughs> fascinating, right? Because, you know, you can make a sartorial choice um I'll, I'll do the pun right like like Jean-Paul Sartorial choice of like using your radical freedom to be like oh I'm gonna wear you know this fancy outfit to McDonald's right or I'm yeah. gonna dress like a bum to go to a, the, the fancy banquet right we could yeah. make that choice and, and at you know any moment what? like sometimes that kind of stuff sticks like sometimes you just do it being like i don't know i don't care i'm just gonna try this like super flamboyant thing on or the other way around and then you actually find yourself you know being like oh, i actually you know what like i feel kind of comfortable this way and i prefer this and i think like in in the literature like in queer fashion for example and like uh, and drag and so on it's just like you know, like, I don't care. I'm going to go to the grocery store wearing this. And because that that's how I feel right. And and because there, there is a creation, there is experimentation there. And uh, that's a whole study of, like, the history, you know, in terms of, like, the history of fashion, a whole branch of the history of fashion that is actually fascinating in terms of thinking about identity and gender, obviously, uh, and intersectional questions, but also in terms of thinking about what does it mean to experiment and find yourself in a position in which you're, like, oh, I like how things are going right now. So maybe they should go in this direction. And, uh, and obviously that's not necessarily a narrative. Uh, it's, it's more like it's a constellation of different moments that end up like affecting each other somehow. Yeah, 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 right. And, and I, I think related to that is one thing that we've touched on multiple times, but I just want to spend a bit of time thinking about it is the relationship between fashion and our bodies right now obviously that relates to seeing bodies on film as we see them adorned and, and wardrobed mm -hmm. and uh you know and you know but you give an account of the the role or the relationship between the two and so i just want to spend a bit of time and maybe we'll end with this um yeah. the relationship between fashion and the body yeah um i have like two like two things i guess just two main things that I want to say about it. Um, one is that like, it kind of like connected to the literature in like body aesthetics and positive aesthetics. And uh, when we think of bodies, we very often think about like staring at bodies. Like we look at other people, like I can, uh, I mean, unless everything is a podcast that you're still gonna have like a, a person in front of you. And uh, I always wonder if clothes can actually help us stare better. And uh, it's uh, it's a possibility of like using clothes as a form of exploration. Obviously, like the counterpart here is just so evident, right? Like you are staring precisely because the clothes are kind of like enhancing one feature or constricting another one and so on. But like in, I use examples in the film, uh, like one example that I use in the book, sorry, uh, is the Furiosa in Mad Max Fury Road and she's an amputee. And uh, we are really invited to stare at the fact that she's an amputee. And in this kind of staring through this prosthetic arm that was, that was built for the film, it's so interesting and intriguing because there is 
you know, noticing that she's missing an arm, but at the same time, because of that, sometimes you're also noticing that she's the most badass person in, you know, the overall film and, and the real character. And so you start connecting all these different points. Um, in, uh, you know, very, very often fashion has been used to signal like your own identity. And so you're actually supposed to explore because I'm like, I'm wearing this specific pin or because like I'm rolling my collar in this specific way, I'm signaling something to you. So stare at that specific aspect of, of me, uh, of my clothing, so that you can know something about me and about my body identity and my gender and my race and in what I'm thinking about it. So that's that's definitely like one aspect and I explore this like through film examples in the book uh, but now I'm exploring it from another standpoint so I guess like it does work as an end because it's also what I'm doing right now um I'm working on on fashion and touch like the actual sense of touch and uh, I've really started thinking about this as I was writing this book I was writing this book during the pandemic and as I was writing the book, I was pregnant, which is a moment in which touch just becomes the most important thing of all to begin with because you just don't fit into your clothes anymore. They're just like too tight or, you know, whatever it is. And uh, everyone talks about looks and sometimes people are also like, that's, maybe that's one of the reasons also why philosophers have always been like afraid of fashion because it's so related to looks and appearances. And uh, Plato would um, hate it. Like, they just hate it. Like, <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Um, but fashion is so much related to touch. First of all, it touches your body. It's literally constantly on your body. We talked about like the impossibility of being naked before, right? Like that kind of touch is constant. No one touches your body more than your clothes, period. Like for, and that's going to be the case for like, for the, like your entire life. But also I like touch in terms of uh, the actual sense of like being touched by fashion. So what I'm exploring right now is the fashion of something. I mean, the, the kind of like, it's a whole like set, it's a whole like, I like to call it like a rainbow of things. So they actually just like start, it's like up in the sky as you start thinking about touch because there is a connection with the body and this kind of like just physical connection that naturally makes you think about your body identity because it's the closest thing. People talk about fashion as a second skin and this has been like done like a number of times, but um, thinking about that connection is actually really relevant. But then I'm like talking about, okay, being touched by fashion is also like having an emotional connection to it. And, uh, in, in a kind of emotional connection. I mean, we you can go back to William James, right? Like, and he's talking about like feelings are like emotions are feelings in the body. And then you move on to Jesse Prince that defended like a kind of like more like a 2.0 version of this uh, um, with a lot of studies. And I, in you know, and there is so much like every time I talk to people about just like, on the one hand, they're touching your body. On the other one, they're touching you somehow people have always come up with like examples of this. And, uh, you know, like when uh, they're, they're always like item of clothing, they're like, you're attached to for a specific reason, right? Like they do touch your body, but they, they signify something. They have a specific kind of meaning. And that meaning is often emotional. Like I'm thinking like, I don't know, like some of my, my mother's clothing, right? Like it's, they, they can touch me, they can touch my body, but they actually bring those specific emotions. With children's clothing is also that like a, a friend of mine to me like yeah my first thing that came to mind is like well when you're undressing a child actually when you're dressing a child to be honest the only thing you care about really is touch because you're always worried that like something is gonna like irritate the skin or something like that so that's actually also in my research but then there is the emotional value like you know you're like ready to like make a donation or like pass on the clothes to somebody else and you're looking at the little sweater and it's like man, really, this one too? Can we just like keep it forever and then I frame it? <laughs> and and it's, it's something that happens. And, uh, and so that's kind of like, and then it's related to sustainability, is related to a million other topics again. And uh, hopefully there will be a paper out soon on this. And, um, and that's kind of like how I'm moving on. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. And and yeah, my wife and I have definitely kept some of our kids clothes that they've yeah, thrown out <laughs> of. And, you know, just thinking, you know, as you're talking, you know, thinking about, you know, those items that are hanging in the closet that you'll probably never wear again. 
but you're not going to get rid of them. And it, I think it relates to the personal identity stuff that it yeah. puts you in touch with a part of yourself, right? One of your past selves, like it, it helps you connect back to that. And why would, you know, you yeah. Marie Kondo, like, you know, oh, I haven't yeah. worn it in six months, and, therefore get rid of it. No, screw yeah, that. And, like, keep the thing. <laughs> and you know what? In, like in my fight for like sustainable fashion, we should always all remember that like whatever you're wearing has been made by someone and yep. has been touched by someone. And clothes are about sartorial design and they're about stitches, they're about hands, they're about people making things. And touch comes way before looks are created. And that's also why I want to talk about it. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to that future paper that's in, in the works. But once again, the book is A Philosophy of Fashion Through Film on the Body, Style, and Identity. Uh, everyone should check it out because it's a terrific book. So Laura, thank you so much for joining me. This is a really fantastic thank you, discussion. Thank you so much.